I'm Lear Powell, and I'm, I started um, working with Christmas trees and, and uh, went to school at Lees McRae College in the 80s. And I worked part-time on a Christmas tree farm, and you learn a lot about insects and diseases when you work with Christmas trees. So that's kind of how I got started working with trees and insects. Um, and over time, um, I worked more with nursery and landscapes. And when Hemlock Woolly Adelgid came along in early 2000s in our area, they had a meeting at Elk River Country Club uh, where my friend Brad and Bob work and um, invited a bunch of us, uh, you know, landscape uh, riff raft and commoners in to talk about it. And I, I knew something was up. And it all sort of boils down to, you know, money and who's got money to spend on trees and working with insects and chemicals or whatever but one of the property owners there um, had bought a piece of property and it has a hem it still has a hemlock on it and it's 58 inches in diameter at the base and he's like he's like what do you know about this and I was like not much and he's like well he's like I want you to come look at my tree and I was like okay and we went and looked at it, uh, Mr. Godbold's tree he happened to be like the president of a big bank um, and uh, he said, he said, son, the tree, no, the tree dying is not an option. And I was like, got it. And so that's when we really started looking into, you know, how do you deal with this? And at the time we thought we were going to get a crane maybe and spray this thing. Cause that's what we do in the Christmas tree industry. We spray stuff and, um, and agriculture and whatever. But then, you know, I've, that's what inspired me to become a certified arborist because to really get employed and get work in this with good clients, you know, you gotta have some credentials. So becoming a member of ISA and becoming a certified arborist was my next step, which um, basically meant taking a test. But anyhow, it's another discussion. But How did you say this? Big tree, or did you? Well, that's what I'm saying. So anyhow, you know, and ISA has a really good network, um, like a lot of professional organizations. And I started networking with people in, in New England who had been dealing with this longer than we had. And they were using these relatively new systemics, uh, insecticides, synthetic insecticides, and more specifically, neonicotinoids, which is a discussion for another day but synthetic nicotine merit is a common name merits the workhorse of saving hemlocks so thousands maybe millions of trees have been treated with merit from georgia to canada and like you know neighborhood people and people were assembling groups and treating trees with merit and you can do a direct injection into the tree, you can put it into the roots, you can spray it on the foliage, and it's very effective at uh, chewing, sucking pests that feed in the vascular system of the tree, which adelgids do. They're feeding in the sap. So if you put this merit and a midocloprid around the roots of a tree, it'll suck it up, it goes into the canopy, and then the adelgids feed on it and they die. And I don't think the chemistry actually kills it, but I think the, 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 the nicotine, the effect of the synthetic nicotine makes it like freak out and get sick and die. But anyhow, um, so all, no other tree, because we're going through it now, I don't think could have provoked the uh, emotional response that hemlock does like all the people we come uh, that live here and come up here in the summer you know there's no other tree i don't think that really says mountains to them like hemlock so it really got this emotional thing going and during that early 2000s the economy was doing really well and there was a lot of money out there <laughs> so um people started looking at like the country clubs that I work with and private landowners, the media was putting a lot of articles out, you know, so there was a lot of attention being drawn to this. Um, at that time, we didn't have a biological solution. They were working on it. And I don't want to open it up too much, but there was another 
biological solution that the government was working with that didn't do quite as well. And that's another story, but Saja Skimnis was a predator that they found and isolated in Japan or and they felt like it was going to be the one to do the work and the government invested thousands and hours and probably millions of dollars in rearing this beetle in labs and releasing it and we have trouble finding it and and it it's probably participating but not like Laracobius is participating um, but anyhow getting back to the chemical treat so anyhow I you know I met with people at Grandfather Mountain at the resort at the resort at the swinging bridge at um, the clubs and they're like all right you know and there's other people they were sort of interviewing and I was kind of new to the whole thing anyhow um, and what I did know was that you know with hedges and big trees you could do these systemic treatments you could spray the insects not hard to kill you can spray soap on it in the summertime and kill it as long as you make contact you know, the good thing about a systemic is it gets fully involved in the tree and into the foliage and in the sap. And it can be almost like a silver bullet. Like you can just about eliminate. So, you know, there was this big opportunity for people like me. And there was a handful of us that really got involved in it. And we were treating, I mean, I, I treated individual trees for people. I treated hedges. I worked with country clubs. I had a team of uh, guys at Hound Deer's Club. We went through the woods. We treated trees. Um, and, it, you know, we had, like, on some of these bigger properties, we had, like, uh, we even had m some of the membership would be like, okay, you're in charge of this quadrant. And the people got really involved in it, you know, and, and doing it. So we really knocked it back really hard. Um, and... For instance, at Elk River Club, I treated a lot of, there's a lot of big hemlocks along the, the main road going into the club, to the clubhouse. And we went in there and we, we did soil injections into these trees one time. And that was, I don't know how many years ago, eight, 10 years ago. And we haven't done anything since. Well, there was Laracobius release near there and we haven't taken a real close look, but I probably will tomorrow because I'm going up there tomorrow. But these trees from a distance and from the car, which is the main thing, they look beautiful. They're green, they're big, they're, they don't even look like they were hurt. So part of what happened, you know, like with treating a lot of these trees in the early 2000s with the chemistry, um, they didn't really get hurt by the adelgid. So it's kind of, I, I kind of look at it like human health. You know, if you, you know, if you got a clogged artery and they go in there and they fix it before you have a heart attack, your, your heart's still going to be pretty good and vigorous. If you have a heart attack and then they fix you, then you might not be as vigorous. Well, a lot of these early treated trees, they still maintain their vigor and their density. And a lot of them have only been treated like one time, maybe twice over almost what almost 20 years now um so this imidacloprid has this ability to last a long time and they can prove that it stays with the tree for years and years and all that um but the idea was you know we're going to treat trees with chemicals until the scientists can help us figure out how to if we can treat this biologically and now so now we're in a different place because Dick and I went meetings. He would be on that end of the room and I'd be on that end of the room. And then slowly we've migrated together and this thing that we like, you know, that we like to call IPM, right? Integrated Pest Management. So to kind of bring it all together for me, I deal with homeowners that, um, you know, if you see a Delgid, that's, this was our thing, you know, if you see any of that white Delgid, call me, you know, because we're going to, treat it, spray it, and this and that. Well, now we have a different story to tell people. If you see a Delgid, well, you're probably gonna have some predator in there. So don't get so alarmed, right? We're not gonna pull the chemicals out yet. But I have clients who have, and you know, 
On Main Street in Blowing Rock, I have a client who has a hedge, and it's a 100-year-old hedge, and it hangs over the walkway going into town. It's up towards where the old hospital used to be. And, you know, when you deal with individual clients, you kind of get an idea of what their tolerance or what their desire is. And so, you know, these people have zero tolerance for adelgid. They don't want adelgid in their hedge. I don't let Adelja get in their hedge. I mean, they spend thousands of dollars annually to trim this hedge, keep this hedge healthy. I do tissue samples, I do soil samples, I do, you know, it, they're at the top of my, my chart, right? Um, and then, you know, other people have more informal properties and they might have a few hemlocks that are nice in their yard and then they have hemlocks that go beyond. And so now my personal sort of theory with those type of clients is, you know, that we treat the trees that are right around the house, hedge, you know, ornamentals, hedges, um, big forest type trees that might have had some compaction or um, some construction issues when the house was built, you know. But those trees, you know, and, and they want to, when they pull into their property, they want to see beautiful, big, green, you know, trees. Um, and so, you know, what we've done is we've quit treating further away from the house. You know, the further away from the house, the less treating we're doing. But right there, the stuff that's right in your face, I still treat, and I still feel like it's a good idea to treat because, you know, in the landscape, uh, Larry Cobius, like for my hedge on Blowing Rock, it's never going to give them that, as we say in the uh, in the business, that clean look that chemicals will do. Um, and we need these things to kind of have this kind of unnatural, clean <laughs> look that uh, that, as Dick was saying, off-site. These are off-site areas where we've planted hemlock, which is a tree that people try to convince to be a shrub a lot, right? And I have to have that conversation with people because they're, you know, they, when a hedge is 100 years old and they've been trimming it and trimming it every year and not letting it grow and it doesn't get to photosynthesize or anything, I mean, after 100 years, you know, I'll go look at a hedge and they're like, well, what's wrong with that one? And there's like a big hedgerow. And I'm like, wow, you know, you've been trimming this thing for, you know, 60 years. And you know there's a there's a branch that's that long and maybe the hedge is only about you know that really the branches are about that long well if that tree was growing out in the forest it would probably be an 80 foot tree you know with 30 foot branches and so you know as a human we're be you know we we like to trim them down and make them and that is a very challenging part of managing hemlock woolly adelgid um, you know with the more natural and I and I don't I try not to pay a lot of attention to the ornamental stuff because to me the big forest trees are the important part of this because those that's where they rely on other animals and insects to live um, amongst the hemlocks and the trout and, um, and all that but you know there's times and they haven't had one in a while but I have to say one of the one of the best rewarding times that uh, Dr. McDonald and I connected. They, they do a three-day symposium on hemlock woolly adelgid, the forestry department does. And you get to sit and hear all kinds of different studies that go on, you know, how chemistry works, how bio biologicals are working. And the last time we had one in Asheville, Dick got up to give his talk about Laracobius, and they had known about Laracobius but the government hadn't really focused on it. But he'd been focusing on it. <laughs> and their predator, which we pretty much deem as unsuccessful now, and most, um, most people who are objective would, you know, and really look at the science would probably agree. But the, but the government still sort of stands behind Sagiskimnus because they put a lot into it and they have to. Um, but anyhow, Dick got up and got to give his talk about Laracobius, and it, and, and it was it was very uh, rewarding for me sitting in the back because it was sort of a an aha moment, and a lot of those researchers knew he was right, but 
they couldn't get up and say much because of the people that signed their check. <laughs> right <laughs> and so there's Dick up there and they're like ah, there's that McDonald again causing problems but ultimately he was right and as an entomologist you know entomology is a fairly boring I think as a <laughs> you know it's a lot of it's a lot of this you know it's a lot of time in the lab and this and that but but to be able to get involved in something, you know, he's been involved in a lot of things, but to be able to get involved in something like this and really come up with what is an answer and a success, because when you look on the internet now, I mean, major players are involved in this. So I sent Dick an article. Um, there's this place in Rocky Gap where near in yeah. Western Maryland where my aunt lives, and that's been a big release site. And recently they went in there and they collected Laracobius out of Rocky Gap Park and they moved them to a site in Pennsylvania where there's a lot of mature hemlocks where one of the planes that went down and that was shot down in 9-11, it's a memorial site. And so that shows you that the government is engaging in this and they're behind it. But they're not going to get up and say, oh, Dick McDonald's the greatest guy ever. That, that would be against their morals because they have their other guys. Uh, yes? Um, so how does the, the, do the pesticides and the good beetles work? Do they kill them too? Or yes, they, they probably will. They probably would. And so the idea is if you have trees that you're treating chemically, you kind of keep them on, as we like to say, the, uh, the treadmill. You just keep them, as we say, clean. You don't ever let a delgid get into those trees. You keep them sprayed, you keep them, and like I said, this imidacloprid will last for years, so every five or six or seven years, if you hit them with a little imidacloprid, then the, the predator's not gonna be attracted to a tree that doesn't have food. <laughs>